my signature? Yes. Just so you know that mic is hot right now. Yeah. So, the attendance. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Just put my title. On. There we go. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome.
Got it. Got it, got it, got it, got it. And uh, now if you're gonna walk around That's what I was just gonna ask. You wanna be in the speaker because they need to put a microphone on you as well. Or if I just stay at the podium. If you just stay at the podium you'll be fine. Emma, can you put this one in the podium? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of am a walker. Is it okay to have one in the other pocket? Okay. Just talk. Stark a little bit. Can I open the Diet Pepsi because I'm thirsty? Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, Dr. Nick. Mike's in Charles. Welcome. This is not going to stay on. Yeah, I was going to say, speakers don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> so we should have both of yours up. Perfect. All good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, and here is. Yep. Your Get that on the desktop. Uh -huh. So is he gonna go about an hour? No, I go an hour. So kind of perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. So when I do the introduction, I'll do, so I'm just going to introduce say welcome, thank you for being here, Training Council, SSF, and I'll turn it to Russell. Russell. And then to turn on this mic, you just push this. Yeah, I've used that before. Great, thank Perfect. you. And then they have a... I'm so bummed that HMP is in the other room. They'll come in after. Oh, they're going to come. Oh, so look, there'll be hopefully a yeah. number of them. Great. Am yeah. I still taller than you guys out here? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Probably. Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is depressing. <laughs> that is seriously. We should do a picture with me standing up on this. I like that. Yeah. 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 Ye
Oh, we should. We should. We should have a picture with all of our speakers. Actually. Yes. Let me get Lynn. Let's get naked. Let's get the scene. Where's Lynn? Is Lynn our picture person today too? Yes, she is. Oh, I'll just. Hi. You heard me.
Hello, everyone. Hello, good evening, welcome. Uh, we're going to hear from our director of the Graduate School of Public Health, Dr. Modnat. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to one of our uh, GSPH Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone here and thank our wonderful speakers for the night. It's a pleasure to have everyone here. But also wanted to give credit to our GSPH Student Council, led by Francis who introduced me, um, it, this, they have done a wonderful job getting resources for these events. And so the other thank you also goes to the Student Success Fee Program at SCSU that have been, has funded all of these activities, our wonderful speakers, food, the venues. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to do that to our students. It's a great experience. So welcome, everyone. And as another side note to this before I let the event start off is I also wanted to point out we do have our alumni social mixer coming up. It's for both our student and faculty and students and alumni. Uh, April 27th, information's on our website so you have your chance to join us on April 27th in the evening. It'll be a wonderful event. So we hope to see many of you there. Um, I'm also going to introduce Russell who's going to introduce our speaker. All right, so I'm here to introduce Dr. Nick Yefintidis. <laughs> he is an advocate for those in his community who need it the most. He currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer for San Diego County, and it's 3.3 million residents, which is 1% of America's population. He is the founding co-chair of San Diego's Childhood Obesity Initiative, was the Chief Medical Officer of one of the largest network of community clinics in San Diego County, the chief medical officer of the Council of Community Clinics, and was publicly elected chairman of the board for Palomar Health, the largest public hospital district in California. He is thankful for the fact that he has never seen a patient with private insurance in his life. As a result of his personal health transformation, he now advocates for population health transformation. Dr. Nick is a cancer survivor, and has been to as many countries as he is old. <laughs> his daughters, Veronique and Zoe, are the joy of his life, and they make their home in Escondido, California. So please welcome Dr. Nick. Thank you. Thank you. You're job well done, Russell. You even know how to say my name. Nice job. How the hell are you? What the health is going on here tonight? And why are you all sitting in the back? I feel lonely. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much. Um, I ask for your permission today to ask uh, if I can attach a pair of lips to my heart. I don't know if I am a uh, distinguished speaker, but my desire tonight is to be an authentic speaker and a sincere speaker. The reason for that is that the role that I have that Russell mentioned as the Chief Medical Officer of San Diego County um, is one that I'm not really qualified for academically. But as a result of what I have been through, in some ways, for me, this is a trajectory of personal integrity. Meaning, I believe the world is starving for real people who have real solutions to life's real problems. And this is a very cynical world that we live in, a very polarized world. And I feel honored to be doing what I do, but largely I feel like I have the privilege of doing it as a result of what I've been through. And it's interesting, 
And I'm somewhat of a sentimental and symbolic guy who's into thinking about life and reflecting and commemorating. This week is an exceedingly important week of my life and I'm actually celebrating, in a sense, a double anniversary. And for the first time in all the years that I'm celebrating this anniversary, it's numerically symmetrical because one thing that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, I am celebrating the eight-year anniversary of this week. And the other thing that I'm celebrating the anniversary of this week is the 16-year anniversary. So there's interesting numerical symmetry that had these things not happened, I would not be standing before you today, okay? The other thing you need to know, why I am feeling more like a authentic speaker rather than a distinguished speaker, is that to me, students are the most important people in my life. And I have a confession to make to you, because I know the vast majority of you are students, I know a couple of you are faculty and some graduates and, and so forth. But when I speak to students, for as weird as this may sound, I am not up here for the next 50, 55 minutes, frankly, thinking about you. The way that I'm wired is that I'm thinking about life 30 years from now. Because about 30 years ago, I was an MPH student. And I had no idea that 30 years later, I would be doing what I'm doing. And I've made some sacrifices in life. It was mentioned that I've never seen a patient with private health insurance. So I'm not the wealthiest guy materialistically, but there are very few people who have more experiential wealth that I feel that I do. And because I feel so blessed with experiential wealth, I consider myself a relational venture capitalist. Does that make sense? A relational venture capitalist who invests in people with the dividends potentially, if there's anything of value that I may be able to leave with you tonight, the dividends being having the capacity to have indirect benefit on this community because of the investment of this even hour that I'm making with you and the way that I'm thinking about your influence in this community or some other community in the future. So I thank you for that, but it's weird for me to admit to you as I stand up here, I'm not necessarily thinking of you as my audience. There's this funky wiring that I have that I'm looking at you all 30 years from now wondering what you're going to be doing and wondering if there's any capacity of me offering something that may stir your soul, stimulate your mind, encourage you in some way, that could reap dividends in the future. So back to the anniversary. The eight-year anniversary this week was when I actually became the quote-unquote chief medical officer of the county. But for the first seven and three-quarter years, just in the last three months, have I made the transition of being a consultant and a very part-time liaison to the county to now being the full-time chief medical officer. And I'll talk about that as I try to describe what the health is happening in San Diego, because my choice sort of correlates with what's going on right now in society. But when I first became the chief medical officer eight years ago as a consultant on a part-time basis, um, it just so happened that eight years ago right now, we were dealing with an epidemic that was very unusual in terms of the timing of the year in which it started. It was an infectious epidemic, a kind of flu, hint, hint. Does anybody remember what was happening right now, eight years ago? H1N1. H1N1. Also, with all due respect to our farmers, swine flu, right? That's how it was commonly known. Now, the interesting thing is I'm blessed to speak Spanish. The first day that I showed up 
They're like, hey, Dr. Nick, you're bilingual, right? I'm like, andale pues, claro que sí. <laughs> ya ni modo, who's your papito? So I'm like ready. And, and they're like, well, we need you to do a press conference for the Spanish media in San Diego County. I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. On what? Swine flu. I'm like, what's swine flu? <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I had never heard of it before in my life. I'm not like an infectious disease guy or anything. So I spent a lot of time for like 90 minutes, never having heard of it before, give me an inside scoop on public health here, okay? <laughs> Getting prepared and doing a, a press conference on swine flu. Now, the interesting thing about swine flu, I don't know if you remember, the first case in the world was diagnosed here in San Diego County. And obviously, though I had never heard of it before, I became an expert at swine flu, right? And to this day, I have people asking me, hey Nick, I got all these symptoms, how do I know if I have the swine flu? And I love showing them this picture. I say, if you wake up in the morning looking like this, you better go see your doctor, okay? <laughs> Now, some of you are going to find it very awkward that I can joke about this. <laughs> Life can be very cruel and unpredictable. The first case was diagnosed here in San Diego County. The third person in the world to die from complications from swine flu eight years ago was, believe it or not, my own father. And what was so hard about that is that he passed away right before the vaccine was available. And the students are probably too young to remember this. The graduates and the adults may. That year, something very interesting was going on with regard to the swine flu because the vaccine had to be rushed into production. It was a lot earlier and there was a lot of opposition a lot of crazy conspiracy theory stuff of people like saying, no, don't take it and all of that. Can you imagine the impact that it had on people when they would be like, hey, Dr. Nick, what do you think about the swine flu vaccine? And my response simply was always to them, you know, had the vaccine been available a little bit earlier, I would still have a father. I would consider taking it if I were you. That was eight years ago this week, 16 years ago this week, and we don't have too much time to talk about this because uh, I only have about 40 minutes left. But some of you know that there is a personal story to me as well. Unfortunately, I have spent the majority of my life as a board certified medical hypocrite in that every single day with my patients, I had to qualify what I told them with the famous words of do as I say, not as I do. Because I, Dr. Nick Ifantides, actually used to weigh almost 500 pounds. It's an ongoing struggle, but I used to have a size 62 waist. That's five foot two around, okay? I'm taller than some people in this room, sidewards I was. I was on seven medications for diabetes, high blood pressure, degenerative joint disease, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. I had a machine that I needed to use to sleep at night because I had sleep apnea. I had depression and anxiety because it was heavy on my heart, being the hypocrite that I was. And part of my story is that 16 and a half years ago, completely unrelated to my weight, I ended up having a life-threatening form of cancer. I'm so blessed. I love calling myself Dr. BBB, blessed beyond belief, because it was the cancer that activated me. And when I recovered from cancer and the surgery and the chemo and the radiation therapy, Finally, there became a connection between my head and my heart. I no longer could take my health for granted. And I became a health steward, somebody who was passionate about 
taking care of the gift of health that I've been granted. And back in 2001, and I started the trip 16 years ago this week, some of you remember the day, one of my former medical assistants is here this evening, I took a one-year sabbatical, couldn't afford to do it, but when I got to the point of being ready to change my life, I couldn't afford not to. I borrowed the money, I bought a used RV, and over the course of one year, without surgery, I traveled across every state in America, went to baseball stadiums in every ballpark in America, which had been one of my fantasies since I grew up in Greece and moved to the U.S. and fell in love with America and fell in love with baseball. And without surgery, in one year, lost 270 pounds. Went from taking seven medications to guess how many meds I take today. None. And I'm not here to promote my book or anything, but <laughs> this is my book in one sentence. What I basically, I've written a book. Some doctors, by the way, are all into like being in the New England Journal of Medicine and the JAMA and all of that. You know what my proudest accomplishment is? I've been in the National Enquirer twice. <laughs> and you know what's even freakier than being in the National Enquirer? It was totally true. <laughs> People Magazine, Oprah, the whole shebang. But all of that to say, my take-home message that I shared in the book in one sentence was that I, and I believe people, need to change the way we see a perspective change before I could change the way I look. I had to go from looking at food as a way to deal with my stress, my boredom, my anxiety, whatever, to being fuel. I had to go from being convinced that I didn't have time to work out to being convinced today that I don't have time not to. And I share that because I, as now somebody who, because of the credibility of personal transformation, I'm now promoting population transformation. And I still believe that we are in need of changing the way we see. And as I describe what the health is going on in San Diego, I want you to keep that in mind. As a result of those and other experiences, <clears throat> if I had to summarize, you were to say to me, hey, Dr. Nick, what's like the mission of your life? It's simply this, to prevent the preventable and to avoid the avoidable. What I mean by that is this, folks, the American sick care system, which we're going to talk about in a moment, really spends the majority of its time, treasure, tenacity, and talent reacting to preventable things rather than preventing preventable things. And because we are reacting to the preventable, oftentimes we don't have what we need to then respond to the inevitable. I know I'm using a lot of big words, but I want you to remember the concept of preventing the preventable. Because in some ways, we've made some changes over time from a society perspective, but we have a long way to go. Most of you in this room are not old enough to remember ads like this in Life Magazine. We're literally back in the day, physicians <laughs> promoted cigarettes. Do you imagine something like this happening? So we have changed the way we see about some things, but I venture to say that there's still a lot that we have left that we need to change the way we see about. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I love this country, only in America, right? Can you take an escalator to the gym? And this isn't in Wisconsin, you all know where this is? Right here in Point Loma. Live well, baby. I'm going to go work out and take out my escalator. So, playful, but here's an example of putting the prevent the preventable into action. A number I wish all of you would remember, because for us it's become sort of our rally cry here in San Diego County. Very simple number with a profound impact. 3450. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three lifestyles. Are they preventable? Are they modifiable? 
Not saying easy, but are they? Of course they are. Three lifestyles, what we eat, if we smoke, whether or not we're physically active, are the primary causative factors of four chronic diseases you see listed there. Metabolic disease, heart disease, pulmonary disease, and cancer. Those four diseases in and of themselves account for over 50% of the deaths in San Diego County. Is this preventing the preventable? I don't mean to be morbid, but news to self, everybody in this room is going to die. <laughs> Bummer, dude. But we don't have to die of something stupid. A lot of people are dying, quote unquote, of stupid things. And when I think about preventing the preventable, that raises to the top. And I'm not partisan, obviously, and this is such a fascinating time. And I'm blessed to be in my role uh, with what's happening at a national level because I want to be part of making a difference. And either way, if the Affordable Care Act continues or if it is dismantled, there's going to be opportunity for influence. But in a nonpartisan way, if you believe what I just shared with you and you're hearing what I'm saying, I want you to think about the dilemma that we currently have with regard to health care reform. Because, folks, I don't know if you realize this, nobody has, quote unquote, designed the American sick care system. It evolved in response to what the historical need was. And if I was the chief medical officer, or I was the public health officer of San Diego County, and we could press rewind or go in a time capsule, and it's 1917 instead of 2017, I'd be giving you a completely different talk if we were here to talk about what the health is going on in San Diego. Because 100 years ago, the things that were happening were predominantly accidents, Genetic diseases, infectious diseases. Why do I have births on there? Folks, when some of us were born, having a baby was like a seven-day experience. I don't know if you know, if you know a few years ago, <coughs> excuse me, we had to pass a law in California ensuring that women giving birth were guaranteed at least one night in the hospital. <laughs> It was on the verge through, without disrespect, of becoming a drive-through experience. But in the past, maternity hospitals and institutions like Mary Birch and so forth grew up and evolved in response to what the need of the day was, right? Supply and demand. Fast forward to today, our diseases that we are primarily consumed with and dealing with are very different. They're lifestyle based. They're influenced by social determinants. We'll talk about in a second. They're environmental. They're behavioral. We talked about 3, 4, 50. What about the current sick care system, frankly, is designed to deal with those illnesses? Not much. And so part of the challenge with health care reform, as it currently is being envisioned, is are we expanding access to an antiquated system, or are we really reforming the way that we deliver care and bringing the health back into the quote-unquote sick care system? And I hope I don't need to make the case for it. Some of you have already heard some of this stuff, I hope, in your classes. The American sick care system, believe it or not, is not that impressive. If you're really sick and you have a very complex, acute, high, complex disease, great place to receive sick care. In terms of the proactive, prevent the preventable wiring, it's not there, folks. And our health rankings reflect that. I'm not going to get into all of that tonight. It's very expensive. We spend much more than any other country in the world now at about $10,000 per person per year in terms of the entire population. If you take the number of dollars divided by the total U.S. population, we're at almost $10,000. It's very inefficient, relatively speaking. Disparities are huge. I hope you've all heard your zip code is more important than your genetic code. 
Do you know that only about 75% of high schoolers in San Diego County graduate? Do you know there are some communities where that number is even less than 70%? If we could do the fast forward that I was talking about with you all in terms of looking at the health of a high school dropout, 30 years from now versus the health of you as graduate or undergraduate students, who do you think would be healthier? The socioeconomic determinants and the disparities that happen as a result of those things are huge. And I honestly think because we have such an enormous amount of our resources being spent reactively, we're not ideally adequately poised. I know this is very conceptual, but we don't have a lot of other money left for important things like education and infrastructure. The sick care delivery system is a beast that needs to be fed. So, I'm a physician. I don't know if there are physicians here. I don't mean to say this disrespectfully, but really, from my perspective, in some ways, Doctors and many quote-unquote health sick care professionals, I would venture to say are really janitors because they spend a lot of their time cleaning up after unhealthy human behavior. This may be a little symbolic, but you know what we need more of? Plumbers. To prevent the spills from happening in the first place rather than spending all of our time and attention on cleaning up after people. And I've referenced this and I want to just reinforce it. Folks, the whole issue of what is known as the socioeconomic disparities is something that we are eager to address because if all the attention as it currently is, is on the left side of this image, when in reality people are being affected and influenced and their outcomes are influenced on what happens on the other side, we have a compartmentalized system right now in society that we in San Diego are fighting to overcome and integrate the whole person, our whole community approach in terms of being able to make a difference. And as I transition, <clears throat> because I promised that I would talk about what the health is going on in San Diego County, I want to kind of make sure that you are all aware of some fundamentals of where you either live or you're coming here to go to school and so forth. San Diego County, Russell already mentioned, has 1% of America's population. One in 100 Americans live here, okay? We have more people living here than 21 states do. It's huge. We're the fifth largest county in the United States. We have very distinct borders, which is very interesting for being as big as we are, because we have a foreign country to our south, an ocean to our west, a desert to our east, and thank God a military base to our north protecting us from Los Angeles. <laughs> Honestly, were it not for Camp Pendleton, Southern California would be one big happy city. Trust me, that prime real estate along there. So the reason that I mention this is having spent time, I went to undergraduate school at Azusa Pacific University in Los Angeles, did my MPH in Loma Linda, okay? Lived in New York, lived in New Jersey for a while, lived in Phoenix for a while. Many places around the country that are large metros People live in one county, work in another, worship in another, sleep in another, educate in another. My point is San Diego, for as big as it is, has that geographic distinctiveness. Of course we have people commuting, by the way, from Mexico. I've just had a meeting a couple weeks ago with an insurance plan that's been developed here in San Diego for Mexican nationals who work in the United States that allow them to get health care during the day here should they need it, but also health care south of the border for themselves on the weekends or in the evenings or their family. So there is commuter traffic, okay? There are people that drive down from Orange County and all of that, but for the most part, most of us live in San Diego. The relevance of that is we are looking at things from a geographic lens, it's very unique to be able to look at things and say, wow, 
if we partner with businesses, if we work with schools, the faith community, the healthcare, quote unquote, sick care system, our local governments and so forth, we are pretty cozy for being as big as we are, and I hope that makes sense. And by the way, another interesting distinctive, which has a lot of implications in terms of health too, I don't know if you know this, we have the busiest border crossing in the entire world. More people go back and forth every single day between Tijuana, Baja California, and San Diego than any other place on the planet. So lots of fascinating dynamics associated with that. And so as I transition and tell you a little bit about what's happening in your community, again, for me, this is a matter of integrity. It relates to what I told you personally. People may doubt what I say, but they have to believe what I do. Somebody else, I heard this quote recently, initially it was attributed to St. Francis, but I found it fascinating, I looked it up, I guess it's not his quote, and it was from a religious perspective, but I also think of it from the perspective of preaching the gospel of good health. Preach the gospel at all times, and when it's necessary, use words. Walk the talk. Live by example. So, I hope that you have heard, as graduate students in public health, that we in San Diego County have a regional vision we call Live Well San Diego. Ultimately, it's a proactive social movement that is not just about health, it's about integrating safety, it's about integrating thriving, and just real quick to give you a sense of the components, if you remember the concept of 3450, our focus with regard to health is aspects that will have the biggest influence for the investment, and it should be no surprise what those are. When it comes to safety, in the absence of safety, there can be no health. And so a big part of our focus is advocating for safe communities, advocating for resilience and preparedness. Part of my role that I'll talk about in a second, I'm now in charge of the entire regional EMS system. If the proverbial quote unquote stuff hit the fan, all the coordination between different health systems and hospitals and all of that stuff is what my life is all about. But that's part of proactively preparing so that we can have a resilient community that is prepared and safe for our citizens. And then thirdly, if you're following the whole concept of thriving and the importance of that, we are so committed to the notion of creating an environment in which people have the opportunity to be educated, to be connected, to be socially engaged, to prosper, to have jobs. That believe it or not, it may sound weird, but I as a doctor spend a lot of my time advocating for employment opportunities, advocating for education because of the connection that those things have with the health and well-being of our community. A few years ago, um, another thing I need to tell you about San Diego is we are an interesting mix. It was a few years ago I was at a conference at something called the Institute for Health Improvement and I was listening to this lecture about regional dynamics and the thought came to me to sort of scratch out on the napkin on a two by two table characterizing communities by the level of either competition or cooperation that exists between regional entities. There are parts of California and parts of this country where there is tremendous competition with very le little regional cooperation, and I jokingly call that the rumble in the jungle. There are other places where there's not a lot of competition, but there's a lot of cooperation. Rural communities would be a good example of this, okay? Where you don't have competitors. If anything, everybody gets along, they all work together. That's the love fest environment. What we have, and this is important for you to understand, as I tell you some of the things that we are working on, San Diego County is very interesting in that we have a very high level of both cooperation and competition. And I call that 
coopetition. Scripps, Sharp, UCSD, Kaiser, Kaiser's opening a new hospital next week. They are literally, no offense, fighting for market share. One of the things that I love about my life working for county now, I have no competition. And I get to be the United Nations. I get to facilitate coopetition. I get to convene tables. I get to bring competitors together to work for the common good. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Because ultimately, what we're trying to accomplish with Live Well San Diego is this idea of collective impact. You've all heard about that, right? Collective impact, together, we can do more than any of us can do together uh, alone. And so if you look at this, you see all the various components that we are actively striving to engage. But remember, people will doubt what you say. They have to believe what you do. So what have we done over the last few months at the county? Two important things. One is one of the key Oh, I forgot I put in these slides I'll talk about for just a second. Part of our way of accomplishing this with Live Well San Diego and all the things that I'm going to talk about, it's not about the county. It's about partnership. And we are now pushing and nearly hitting 300 Live Well San Diego partners who agree with a premise, who agree with a vision, who agree with the components that I talked about, and are formally wanting to collaborate and coordinate things with a county. And right smack dab in the middle, our first ever university that became a Live Well partner, voila, was San Diego State, of which we are so proud of and so thankful for. But this is just a sample, okay? I couldn't put up 300. There's even Dirty Dogs. What's Dirty Dogs? That's a dog walking business that is serious about promoting health as a mechanism by having a pet because it will force you to take them out for a walk and we've got a dog cleaning business who's a Live Well San Diego partner. The hope with all of this, because we live by a seaside, I'll give a ocean analogy, is that folks, there's so much clutter, all kinds of organizations doing things on their own, trying to make a difference. And in the absence of coordination, there's a Greek expression I love sharing called mia tripa stonero. What that literally translated means digging holes in the water. Think about that. A lot of energy and effort, but what do you have to show for it? Not much. And that is unfortunately what's happening because a lot of times when organizations all kind of do their own thing, it's going to have a difference but not as much as it could have. And there are times where it leads to bottlenecks. Once in a while, people are like, oh, let's all work together. Let's all row in the same direction. And they do that, and that's great. My vision for Live Well San Diego, not to impose on our community, but to generate momentum, is to generate waves of influence so that, frankly, no matter which way you're rowing, you're going that way because our region collectively has decided that this is what our strategic vision and our strategic direction is. So what I was going to mention is what have we done in the last few months. So compared to many other parts of the country, I'm not going to speak for Texas, our next speaker will, I don't honestly know what happens in Texas, but in Texas, He's learning what happens in San Diego. But our, in, in, in San Diego, we are the largest in the country integrated health and human services agency. All of our human services, housing, all of those things are integrated under the same leadership of our health and human services agency. One leader, one group of executives, we have influence over those things. And just like we are promoting integration in the community, we're seeking to integrate ourselves. And this past July, I mentioned housing already, but prior to July, our housing authority was actually separate. 
We have now integrated, we're not changing our name to the Health, Human Services, and Housing Agency, but our housing authority is under the same now family. Folks, I don't know if you know this, I was part of We All Count a few months ago, a very early morning at 3.30, got up to do a manual count of the homeless. Not the perfect way to do it, there's different ways. But we have nearly 9,000 people in San Diego County living on the streets every single day. How do you think their health is? By the way, you know how many physicians there are in San Diego County in active practice? About 9,000. So I kind of proposed a solution. If every doc would just adopt one homeless person, it would be good. But <laughs> none of my colleagues went for that. They're like, dude, you're going to be homeless with the way you think. But, um, so we have integrated. Here we are promoting integration in the community. We have integrated health, human services, and housing all under one roof, under one area of influence. The other thing that was done is yours truly was beaten into submission after being a consultant for almost eight years and said, look, Nick, ultimatum was given to me. We need a full-time chief medical officer because we want to coordinate, consolidate, and retool the way that we interface with the community by creating a new division called the emergency or the medical care services division which is going to have these components to it. And just over the last three months, since January, there's a new division at the county that I'm blessed to be facilitating that now has EMS, nursing administration, something called Healthy San Diego, which is the coordination of the five health plans, soon to be seven health plans that cover 900,000 people in San Diego County who are on Medi-Cal and some other specialized programs. So we at the county are stepping up our interface with the local community and looking to partner and position ourselves to be better partners by restructuring ourselves. It adds a lot of credibility when we are willing to transform ourselves as we're trying to transform and make a difference in our community. And an important part of that is data. And as a man of personal faith, at least once a day, when somebody comes and asks me for a favor, graciously, not arrogantly, I say to them, in God I trust you, you gotta show me your data, babe. Show me your data. Because we are striving to be a data-driven and an outcome-based agency that makes informed decisions rather than emotional decisions, reactive decisions, or uninformed decisions. And I don't know if you know this, you live in one of the most data-rich communities of our country. And what do I mean by that? We have three big components of data that we are strengthening and fortifying, envisioning for how hopefully they're going to come together. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Health Information Exchange of San Diego, which is called San Diego Health Connect. I'm very fortunate to be the chairman of the board of this entity. This is an electronic platform. Think of it as a series of virtual pipes that literally connect the healthcare delivery system. So if you were to go to Scripps tonight and you had been at Sharp yesterday with appropriate consent, your physician can make a query and literally have the information from Sharp available to them in the emergency room in Scripps so that better informed decisions can be made. You can't imagine how much duplication there is of fancy things like MRIs and so forth being ordered that literally are unnecessary because of the capacity to instead access them electronically. Part of what we're working on with the EMS system, folks, there are paramedics in this, in this county showing up every day picking up people who have various allergies or complications or whatever and they don't have access to that information. But we're working to have electronic connections 
between ambulance rigs and the hospitals and the health information exchange so that information is available. Could talk about this and give a lecture on this in itself, but wait, there's more. Remember I told you about the importance of the social determinants and all the social services in the community, right? Well, we have what's known as the Community Information Exchange in San Diego County, too. What is that? That is a developing network of information looking to integrate social service providers so that we can get that information in a coordinated fashion as well. It's hosted by 211 that I hope you've heard of. If not, dial it sometime and have a chat with them. Tell them, I'm a grad student at SDSU. I want to hear what you guys do. We have lots of evolving regional tools, and 211 is hosting the Community Information Exchange. But wait, there's more. We, the county, are developing our own, if you would, internal health information exchange Last year, 2016, we have 3.3 million people in San Diego County. Guess how many people we at HHSA touched in one way or another? Anyone have a clue? A third of the population. 1.1 million folks. And we have data on these people. And what we are pursuing with appropriate privacy considerations and making sure that the information is utilized appropriately is to be the first region of the country that truly offers a 360 data view, person-centric view, incorporating all of this element of information from health, social, and county services to be able to proactively make informed decisions. I don't know if you've heard of the concept of hot spotting, where people are following where the heart attacks are coming from and where the admissions are coming from. We're trying to do kindling spotting in San Diego County with LiveWell. Mapping out where is the flammable potential, not the fire. By the time something is a fire, we're reacting. We want to clear the kindling and go upstream and proactively intervene. And having the data to do that is a very important part of that equation. So as I close, let me illustrate this with some examples of what collective impact actually looks like. And there are so many things I could talk about, but I just want to give you a little scratch and sniff of a couple things because, remember, we can do a lot more together than any of us can do alone. And part of the role of the county is facilitating that co-opetition, right? So one of the areas that we do that with is with a group that we partner with called Be There San Diego. What's Be There? Be There is a rally cry. It's about health stewardship. Take care of yourself so you can be there for your loved ones. The audacious goal of Be There is for San Diego County to be the first heart attack and stroke-free zone. We'll never accomplish that because not every heart attack and stroke is preventable, but the majority of them are. And there are way too many people finding out that they have heart disease at the time of either myocardial infarction or, frankly, at the time of myocardial death. A little bit too late at that point, right? So what Be There San Diego is looking to do, it's one of the many examples of collective impact of together we can accomplish a lot more than we could ever accomplish alone is, remember we talked about co opetition students? This is bringing the co opetition of healthcare providers together to be able to collectively make a difference. And part of this is looking at tugging at people's heart. What do I mean by that? I told you what Be There is about, right? Be There, illustrating it. It's her time to shine. Be there, that message. Dad, you never let me win. Now I would let you do anything to have you 
beat me one more time. Okay? Now, that's one thing. We, the county, and we just did this last month, are also part of something very exciting. Brainchild of our agency director who's standing in the back. You all turn around and say hi to Nick Mashion. Nick Mashion is my colleague, my friend, and my boss. Six years ago, we said, hey, what about the possibility of doing something proactive on a very symbolic day? Valentine's Day. Valentine's about love. It's about the heart. Let's capitalize on the theme of Valentine's Day and play on the notion of the message of love your heart by promoting blood pressure screening. Folks, this year, again, sorry, just scratch and sniff. It's gone international. All six border states of Mexico, Massachusetts, Orange County, many of the embassies along the border on the U.S. side, four additional states. We together, on Valentine's Day this past year, a couple months ago, measured over 50,000 blood pressure screens in one day with hundreds of sites and 160 partners. And you want to know something? Over 70 people who had no idea, because hypertension is the silent killer, were diagnosed to have critically elevated hypertension to the point where it was emergent and literally they needed to be transported or see a physician the same exact day. So there is a practical impact, but the other aspect of this is bringing together, again, members and key aspects of our community to collectively embrace the notion that together we can do so much more than any of us could ever do alone. So that's another example. And then I think I have one more. Oh, so let's talk about this. I've given you a few examples of cardiovascular disease. Do you know that in most parts of the country, heart disease is the number one cause of death? Not in San Diego County. Am I going to take credit and say Live Well San Diego is to blame for that? No. But it's very interesting for as big as we are that heart disease is now the number two cause of death rather than number one, the number one cause of death being cancer. Both of them, thankfully, have um, gently decreased, but heart disease much more meaningfully. And I think just one last example, um, and I will maybe just share two more slides and, and wrap it up and maybe see if anybody has questions. This whole relevance of the social determinants is nowhere better illustrated than with high-risk, frail, elderly people who get sent home from the hospital, who unfortunately a lot of times get readmitted because they can have the best workup, the prescription and everything, and the appointments made. But folks, if they don't have food at home, if they don't have transportation, if they don't have access to medication, if they don't have a way to get their medication, if they don't know that gaining three pounds in one day is a bad sign that you're retaining water and you're at risk for tipping over in terms of your heart going into congestive failure. Before this program started, we had an almost 40% readmission rate. 40% of those folks getting back in the hospital within 30 days. Why? Because they didn't have what they needed when they got discharged. We partnered with four of the large health systems, Scripps, Sharp, UCSD, and Palomar Health. We created a mechanism of discharge planning and connections and wraparound support when they went home, and guess what? Bridging that gap that I talked about before, dropped the readmission rate for that same population from 40% to just under 14%. In God I trust. The rest of you, show me your data.
That's what I call data-driven decision-making and outcomes-based quantification, okay? So why do I do all of this? One reason and one reason alone. More than anything in my life, the thing that I cherish is being a father. And I'm actually blessed and also challenged to be a single dad, and I had to apologize to our speaker ahead of time because I have to go home as a single father to brush hair and get two little girls ready for bed tonight. But ultimately what this is all about for me is improving the quality, the choices, the fabric, the foundations of our community so that my daughters will be able to live in a San Diego that has a healthy outlook. I want to leave a legacy of love and health and I just wanted to quantify as I started personally, I'm going to end personally and tell you and confess to you what my motivation is. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share this 50 minutes with you. I think we've got a few minutes, a couple minutes to answer questions. If any of you are more interested in details about Live Well and want to check things out online and so forth, livewellsandiego.org, livewellsd.org is the place to go. All the way in the back, you're on. Hold on, I think uh, they need a microphone. Hi, my name is Jessica, and I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come out here and speak to us students and faculty as well. My question to you, to you is, you're obviously you know, very educated. I'm curious what factors led you to struggle with obesity? Beautiful question, and thank you for asking it. I grew up in another country until I was nine years old. I grew up in Greece. Uh, I don't want to sensationalize it but we were very, very poor. Um, many nights as a child, I cried myself to sleep in hunger. And uh, we were very economically and food insecure growing up as a family. I moved to the United States at the age of nine, and it was a drastic transition, emotionally, culturally, and intellectually for me, and I developed very bad habits, because all of a sudden I went from having nothing to having access to not the healthiest of food, and honestly, transparently, what ended up happening was food became a mechanism by which I coped with life challenges. I was blessed, thank you for noticing, with somewhat of a decent mind because I had gone to school six days a week in Greece. I skipped three grades actually, graduated high school when I was 15, started college very early, was the youngest person to ever go to medical school at UCSD, but emotionally I wasn't caught up. And the bad habits continued. And so for me, and I'm not going to go pastoral on y'all, but a lot of what people do that is unhealthy behavior is trying to satisfy healthy appetites in unhealthy ways. And I did not have healthy coping skills, and so food sort of became a bad habit of, of a way that I dealt with my stress, and it became an uphill avalanche to the point, as I mentioned, that I almost reached 500 pounds. But 16 years ago this week, we've made changes for the better. So thank you for asking that, but that's the rest of the story. Any other questions? Like, ooh, this dude's honest. I told you. <laughs> well, God bless you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> for coming to speak to us. And on behalf of the Student Council of the Graduate School of Public Health, we'd like to present you with one of our official sweaters. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. So everyone will take like a five minute break as we transition to our next speaker. Stretch out your legs, go to the restroom. I think there's some food in the back still. So thank you.
students. Welcome back, students. Welcome back. It's time for our second guest speaker. Dr. Jay Maddock assumed the leadership of the School of Public Health in February of 2015 at Texas A&M University. Dean Maddock previously served as the director of the University of Hawaii Public Health Program for eight years. He is internationally recognized for his research in social, ecological approaches to increasing physical activity. Dean Maddock received his undergraduate degree in psychology and sociology, magna cum laude, from Syracuse University, and his master's and doctorate degrees in experimental psychology from the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Maddock has been named the Bank of Hawaii Community Leader of the Year and received the Award of Excellence from the American Public Health Association Council on Affiliates. He has chaired the State Board of Health, co-authored the State Physical Activity and Nutrition Plan, and was a charter member of the NIH Study Section on Community Level Health Promotion. He has served as a principal investigator on over $18 million in extramural funding. He is an author of over 100 scientific articles and 150 chapters and abstracts. He is president of the American Academy of Health Behavior. His research has been featured in several national media outlets, including the Today Show, Eating Well, Prevention, and Good Housekeeping. Dr. Maddock has given invited lectures in numerous countries, including Australia, Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, Indonesia, El Salvador, and Brazil, and he holds honorary professorships at two universities in China. And tonight we have him here in San Diego at the San Diego State University Graduate School of Public Health. I introduce to you and welcome Dr. Jay Maddock. All right. Have to put the mic up a little bit here. I guess I'm double mic. Howdy, everybody. So in Texas, we have to say howdy, but from Hawaii, I usually have to say aloha, so I'm never quite sure what to say. Um, I guess you just say hi in California. It's kind of boring, right? Like, you need a good intro to get going. Um, so you guys ready to have fun? You ready to wake up? Yeah. It's late. It's hard to do talk, two talks in a row, but hopefully this is going to be fun and interesting um, as we talk about both uh, what I did in Hawaii, what we're doing now in Texas, and uh, hopefully it's somewhat illuminating, but we'll see. It would be terrible. Um, you know, the goal of public health is to increase the years of healthy life in populations, right? Very simple. We all know what public health is. And the question is, can you actually have a successful career in public health, especially academic public health, and actually change populations? I think so much of what we tend to do gets published in a journal, no one ever reads it, and nothing ever happens, and then we say, well, that was kind of disappointing. And so my thing all my entire career has been, how do we actually change populations. And I think we saw some stuff locally here in the first talk. It's going on in San Diego. And I'm going to kind of talk to you through the last 15 years or so of kind of what I've done and, and how it's worked and, and what's worked and, and a lot of things that didn't work. You know, a lot of stuff I do and doesn't work is terrible. But we'll talk about that too. So this actually story dates back to 1998 when many of you were rather small. Um, but uh, back then, the, the um, states sued the tobacco companies and got a settlement. And states like North Carolina bought a morgue. You know, they said, we got tobacco money. Now we, now we know where to put them. Um, other states put their roads and infrastructure. But as Hawaii looked at it, they said, we want to do something different with our money. We actually want to invest in the health of the populations. And so, you know, they set up a, a trust fund with the tobacco money so to be used in perpetuity to um, improve tobacco. And this is back in 1999. So I got my PhD in 1999. I was at the University of Rhode Island with Jim Prochaska. People know stages of change. You've heard of that thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. People have heard of it, right? And so I got a postdoc with a woman named Karen Glantz. Do people do the health theory book? You guys use that here? <laughs> yeah. So Karen was my postdoc mentor out in, in Hawaii. And I didn't know, I think I'm 25, you know, and I got a chance to go to Hawaii, so you're going to take that job, right? You know, live in Rhode Island, you can move to Hawaii, that's a good thing. If you're a career, getting a chance to move to Hawaii, you move to Hawaii, right? <laughs> See all these lessons you're learning already? <laughs> so, I went there and, you know, was on a two-year postdoc and say, that's it, I'm going to two years in Hawaii, I'll play around, then I'll move back to, you know, the mainland. And they set this trust fund up, and what they did is they invested and they put 25% of the money 
into a tobacco trust fund to be spent on tobacco-based prevention programs. They also put 25% into something called the Healthy Hawaii Initiative. And this was an initiative uh, between the State Department of Health, State Department of Education, and the University of Hawaii. The only thing that they did, right, is they didn't realize they had closed the School of Public Health at Hawaii. So if you want to go to School of Public Health, Hawaii doesn't exist. Don't go there. <laughs> you won't find it. But they, they, they lost their accreditation. There were like seven people working there. And they said, now we, we have this contract with Hawaii. We need a faculty member to come and do it. So who's the dummy postdoc you know, that takes the job at an unaccredited school? Me. Right, so I'm like, I'll take the faculty job. That sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, so I took the job and you know, walked into this place where literally there were seven faculty and nine students in an unaccredited degree program. Um, I would recommend that for most people. It's probably not the smartest thing in the world to do, but it was opportunity. And I think that's one thing as you look through your careers, never be afraid of opportunity. And a lot of times when places look like they're at their worst, it's actually the best time to get involved. Because if you go and you get a job at John Hopkins, you're not going to have a lot of opportunity. You're going to be like, you know, 400th in the faculty rank, right? But if you go to a place only seven, like I'm seventh ranked, right? Like that's pretty good. <laughs> so it gives you opportunity. And it, this gave us money, right? And it gave us some resources to be able to do something, which was an exciting opportunity. They did steal some of it later. Damn med school. I hate med schools. But that's a different talk that I give. My medicine dean doesn't like it, but she got to live with it. So HHI was an integrated comprehensive approach to increase the years of healthy life for all people of Hawaii and to reduce existing health disparities among ethnic groups in Hawaii. Have people traveled here to Hawaii? Anybody? Oh, yeah, good. All the time. What do you notice there? Do you notice health disparities? Um, specifically what island? Um, on Oahu, there's a lot of homelessness. There's a lot of homelessness, huge homeless population, which we're saying here in San Diego, also. And, and we see between our Japanese population and our native Hawaiian population, a 30 year difference in lifespan. 30 years. That's crazy, right? And so huge, huge disparities in Hawaii, and that's a lot of, a lot of what we, you know, anything that we did was always, it's a multi-ethnic community, it's 70% ethnic minority, but certainly native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders at a disproportional uh, rate of risk, Japanese at the lowest level of risk in the islands. Um, so you know, the question then is, okay, if we have this money, you know, here I am, fresh out of grad school, you know, not really knowing what to do. And the question is, how do we affect behavior, right? And I think that's the question that we always have is, how do we take all these things that we learn in school, right? You're learning so many things about theories and models and say, how do we actually take this and put this into practice on a state level and make a difference? Well, everybody knows this, right? You want to know in 2000 how many people were using this model? Like zero. I think we were the first state to actually take the ecological model. So if something now is so commonplace in public health, 17 years ago, it was in the, there were some articles on it, people thought about it. Jim Salas hadn't, I'm sure many of you know Jim, um, hadn't started active living research yet. You know, this is pre pretty much anything working on built environment. And we said, let's, let's try and see if we can actually do this. And so, um, Public health impact, this is the first thing I teach my students when we do orientation, right? Whenever we do something, we need to move the needle, right? And it's reach times effectiveness is gonna equal impact. A very simple equation, it's the only equation you'll get tonight. Um, and so we could have a great smoking cessation program, right? Great program, we spend a lot of money, a lot of effort on it. Um, we enroll 300 people and we get 75% effectiveness, which obviously is like amazing effectiveness, right? At the end of that program, there's 225 ex-smokers. All right, that's cool. We could spend our attention and our time on getting a public smoking ban instead, right? In Hawaii, roughly 200,000 smokers. Now, when there's a public smoking ban, it keeps you out of certain areas. So there's certain, there's the whole um, secondhand smoke effects, but it also is, has a small rate of quit, right? The more difficult you make it to smoke, the more people change their behavior. So you can end up with 4,000 ex-smokers, not even what we're talking about, which we're talking about cleaning their air, but look at that. 225 to 4,000. And the question is, and this is what you're gonna see when you work with any kind of health department across the country, is what are they spending their time on? You know, the, the Brazos County one where I live now, they do health fairs, they do information stuff, and it kills me. And I tell them not to do it, and then they look at me funny. Um, 
what is, you know, look, if we really want to change populations, we need to do policy and environment work. It doesn't add up. We, it's fun to do the stuff where you're directly interacting with folks, to do the health fair, to do the blood pressure stuff, but it doesn't have population impact like these things do. Um, everybody's seen this, right? The CDC, um, Tom Frieden pyramid here. And so when we looked at Healthy Hawaii, and now this is, you know, this is the issue that I think we run into. We, we worked mostly in the changing the context, right? Making the healthy decision, the fault decision. That bottom one is hard. And I haven't seen places really willing to engage and really look at that one. And you know, when somebody does, and we can get public health to really change social determinants, I think we're gonna start really making a difference. I don't know of good examples on a, on a state population where we're actually getting to the point where we're engaging with poverty, with homelessness, with the educational system. Uh, it's a hard sell in Texas. Um, as you might guess, our politics are slightly different than California. Um, but it, that, the rung before it is the one where we end up spending most of our time on. Um, and I think that you know, it makes sense. And the farther we can go, I think the more successful we're going to be. So this is what we said back in 2000. In two to five years, we were going to change environments, improve knowledge, attitudes, and norms. Five to 10 years, uh, healthy behavior, improved health of populations. 10 to 20 years, reductions in diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Right? So really setting out the long game. Right? So we're going to say it's going to take 10 to 20 years. And so a lot of times when we fund a program or politicians get behind a program, they're expecting results in two years, four years, like when they're going up for their next election cycle. Right? And this is the thing, we need to play the long game and say, no, you're not going to see these differences. It takes sustained funding. It takes a lot of time. Now, of course, you'll notice this. I was in Hawaii for um, 15 years, so I left before we actually had to show the differences. Um, it's always smart. Get out the door before they catch you. No, we actually just, it actually works. That's a joke. So, so, um, so our goal was to reduce the incidence of chronic disease through uh, physical activity, nutrition, tobacco, um, sustainable changes, um, in physical activity and healthy eating, and then working with our tobacco prevention control, the trust fund, which was set up separately. So one, one thing that's wonderful, and actually California was great in helping us out with this one, is, is we know how to reduce tobacco use, right? We're not so good at obesity. We're like still trying to figure that one out, but we're getting better. But tobacco, we know how to do it. Now, does that mean we are going to do it? Probably, you know, maybe. You know, Kentucky, the smoking rate is still over 25%. Think about that. If you go from states like California, like Utah, like Hawaii, where you're seeing smoking rates down in the 13 14% range, and you go to Kentucky, where one out of every four adults today is a smoker, where you, where you live in this country matters, and, one, and the way we address public health matters, and it affects our lives. And I'll get to that at the end. So everybody's seen this, right? You guys seen that tobacco goes up, tobacco goes down. Um, what's interesting about this is we talk so much about how tobacco is a cultural thing in the U.S., right? Look at the, this is, starts in 1900. At the turn of the century, nobody smoked in America, right? Isn't that wild? I mean, do you think about, you know, when we talk about, oh, it's been around, you know, we're trying to change this big cultural thing. 117 years ago, just about nobody smoked. Do you know what happened right around there in the World War, World War I era? Anybody want to know why smoking went up? This is the interactive part. <laughs> advertising. Advertise, wasn't advertising that drove it up. What drove it up a lot? Hmm? Not the depression. That would be uh, t the rate there on the Great Depression where it actually goes down a little bit. No, rationing. rationing the, some of that military stuff. But there's something that actually driv drove the whole thing. What? The machine rolled cigarettes. All of a sudden, cigarettes became very cheap and easy to roll. And so we had a glut. Like we have what today in the food market do we have a glut of? Hmm? Not french fries. We do have probably too many french fries. What do we have a glut of in America in the food supply? So it's got so it's it's in soda. High fructose corn syrup, right? We have tons because we've subsidized corn syrup, right? We see it in all our products and it's, it's, you know, we have to get it out into the marketplace. Exact same thing happened in tobacco, right? There was a glut of cigarettes. Well, when there's a glut of cigarettes, we gotta get people to use them, right? It's a marketing thing. So we, it's almost like we're seeing the same thing over again. And then we did a whole bunch of things to bring it down on a national level, but 
we know that that decline is dramatically different depending on what state you lived in and how seriously your state took the public health of its population um, to address tobacco use. So how do you reduce smoking behavior? It's pretty straightforward, right? Knowledge, health, literacy. You need to know it's bad. And most people know smoking's bad for them these days. You probably find that. If you go around telling people smoking's bad, it's probably not gonna reduce the smoking rate, correct? Yeah. Make it cost more, simple. Limit people, places people can smoke. Make it hard to be a smoker. Help people quit, make it uncool, all right? If we do those things, we reduce smoking. That's, that's what it takes, right? Um, so what reduced it? You know, the, the Surgeon General's major report saying this is important from the top, having warning labels, taxes, smoke-free ordinances, quit lines, reducing youth access through the SINAR amendment federally, and modeling social norm setting. So in Hawaii, we did, um, we did a lot of counter-marketing, right? And we aimed it specifically at teens. We put these up in all the malls, uh, all across the state. We have, obviously did uh, television and radio stuff too, but being in the malls, being where the kids were, was huge. And you saw this huge shift, and you see it now today. Now, what's interesting now, of course, is that vaping has come in. Because just when you think you have the tobacco companies, they're back. And they've made vaping cool, right? And you're like, ah, oh, Jesus. But, you know, what are you going to do? If they just go away, we wouldn't have anything to do. And then we did quit lines. My buddy Randy, he's a smoker, he quit. He's very happy. Um, you know, but using local people that actually did call the quit line and quit um, was really successful for us. You don't get tons of penetration, but it, it does help, and it actually makes a lot of the laws palatable to folks when they say, oh, how can you raise you know, the, the cigarette tax again, that kind of stuff. Well, we're going to um, make sure that they have quit services for everybody. Um, this is Sinar, which is a state inspections. I ran this for a couple of years in the late 90s, early 2000s. This is just sending minors into stores to try to buy tobacco. So when we started doing it, 44% of the stores sold. That's not good. When we actually started giving them fines, they learned their lesson. And they learned it very, very quickly. If you look at the, between 1996 and 2000, we dropped to 7%. And there's just people that just somehow can't seem to figure it out. Like we'd send the kids in, they'd ask for the ID, they'd look at the ID, the ID would say they were 16 and they'd sell them cigarettes. And you're like, oh. You know, I think they're even trying to card, they just can't add. <laughs> but, you know, that's, we were never able, we got down to 4.6 one year, we almost got it, but you know, it's, and it's, it's not really scoffless, it's, it's carelessness typically. Um, you know, it, it's, it's low, low paid folks that are just not paying that much attention to it. So what else do we do? Well, so policy was big for us, and policy is always gonna be. So I chaired the Coalition for Tobacco Free Hawaii um, back in 2006, and we, we got smoking banned in all workplaces. And it's crazy, because policy is like the weirdest thing in the world. We have four counties in Hawaii. So Hawaii is a little tiny state. Um, and every county passed a different smoking ordinance. So like on Oahu, you could smoke in bars. On Maui, you couldn't. On Kauai, you could go back and forth between a bar and a restaurant, because the, somebody on the county council's brother owned a restaurant that people like to go to and smoke at night. That's what happens in the small counties. So they all had different laws, and so the restaurant association finally came and said, this is ridiculous, we need the same law across the state. All right, it's gonna be no smoking then. So we get that back in 06. We raised taxes from buck 20 to 320, um, and then the crazy stuff started to happen. You know, it's, um, I got this call from uh, uh, one of our Oahu representatives, and he said, he said, Jay, how can we ban smoking in beaches and parks? I'm like, really? You're going to try that? That's crazy. Um, he goes, no, no, we really want to do it. You know, because we did these darn beach cleanups, and cigarette butts are the number one piece of trash found on beach by volume, right? If you find a discarded tire, do you know how many darn cigarette butts you need to weigh the same amount as the tire? Like a 500 or a 1,000, right? It's ton. They would still bring out these cigarette butts. And it was an environmental health issue that actually got this through. And so, so the guy puts it through and he wants to test it. And he's like, well, I want to do just, um, just these beaches in my district, which is the east side of, the, of Oahu. And 
this other guy's on the other side and he's, he doesn't want the band, right? So he says, wow, those are all the rich areas. You only want this in the rich areas. You know, put it in all the areas. So he said, oh, okay, we will. So he wrote it to, to be the entire county and they passed it. So the guy, you know, tried to play him in politics. Countywide, the next year, state passed it. So you cannot smoke on any beach in the state of Hawaii. Incredible change, right? Then they say, okay, now we're gonna add e-cigarettes to smoking. So you cannot vape anywhere you can't smoke, right? One year that goes through. Like, how is this happening? And then they're like, now we're gonna raise the age of 21. I'm like, no, you're not, no one's gonna do that. 2015, Big Island does it, 2016, State does it. I don't know who these guys are. You, did California get 21 yet? Yeah. You got it this year, yeah? So we were kind of happy because we used to always follow California in smoking and now we're, we're getting ahead of them. But, <laughs> you know, it was, it's just amazing what happens and a lot of that happened through, you know, from the mid 90s on education of elected officials over and over and over again. I think that's the biggest thing with public health policy is that the first time somebody hears something, they tend not to be receptive of it. And the more that you work with folks, the more that you kind of you know, have that consistent messaging, the more they, you know, then it sounded like, oh yeah, we can do that. And then, you know, then in Hawaii, they just took off. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, that'll work, that works for me. Um, so high school students, fourth lowest in the nation. Adults, second lowest. We got lower than California. But we can't beat Utah because they're all Mormon. <laughs> Um, and Kentucky, by comparison, is 25.9, and so almost double the rate. So you're almost twice as likely to smoke if you live in Kentucky compared to if you live in Hawaii, which is a pretty major thing when we look at public health and, and one, something I will come back to. All right, so we know how to do tobacco. So then, you know, we said, okay, with our, that was our trust fund piece and our, our smoking prevention program. Then we said, okay, with Healthy Hawaii, we're really looking at physical activity, nutrition, obesity. Like, can we do this? So we brought this, we want to do school health, we want to do community stuff, public education, professional physician, um, the, the food stamp program, uh, science and research group, surveillance uh, evaluation and research. So integrated school health, and this you know, came out of the CDC work, and it really was pulling together um, the Department of Ed, Department of Health, and the university with the school complexes and the schools. Hawaii school, because there's one school district, right? That let us do a lot of really good policy stuff, because when we do it, it could hit every school in the state. In Texas, every town has their own school district. It's driving me insane. I'll go talk to College Station, and then Brian's right next door, and then I gotta go talk to them. There's too many. So it's one thing is you look at your state, and, and I think California's all ISDs, independent school districts. So it's probably the same thing, but you might get San Diego into one. And I think we can get Houston in one. So. A lot of times what happens is we pay attention to the big cities because the rural communities will drive you insane because they each have their own school district and they're small. You know, so some of these are three schools. Um, but going in and you know, looking at what would be sustainable um, approaches to infrastructure in the schools, um, doing professional development, working a lot with the teachers. And this is something that took us years and years and years of training and changing to really see a lot of effects. Um, you know, health ed and PE programs, uh, putting some of our data collection stuff together. Uh, over 80% of our classroom teachers have been reached with professional development. We did a lot of graduate training. Schools are hard. Um, it costs us a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of training. Every time you bring teachers in for a conference, they have to pay for substitutes. They had to travel. Um, you know, so, so professional development is great. It's tricky. It's really tricky and it's it's, um, you know, what we found better was when we had very specific curriculums. We did really well in PE. Um, you know, when you have specific active curriculums that you can get in, you can give them the curriculum. Um, it was harder in health education, uh, for sure. We got local wellness policies in, by 2007 and 2008 in all of our schools. This is something I'm still working on in Texas. Like, they have really, really good, we put this, um, the SAWS survey, the Hawaii School Health Surveys, back in 2007, so we were able to measure the implementation of school wellness at every single school in the state. <laughs> and we just took it and gave it to, to our school district and college station, and they're gonna use it, so that'll be the first one over there. Um, I'm like, you guys are like a decade late on this, but you know, it's Texas. Um, and uh, nutrition networks, and we did a lot of the um, you know, farm to table stuff, especially in, in our areas where we had large growing. So what did we learn? What do you learn in schools? Well, it's interesting. You know, the biggest factor in our evaluations for the principals. You get a great principal, they get health and schools, everything works. You get a principal that's not interested in it, go home. I mean, it, it really was that 
bad. And so what we did is we said, you know, how are we going to have to do this? So what we started doing is working with our resource teachers, our best health and PE teachers, and getting them into the principal tracks and saying, let's get them to the next generation of principals here. And a bunch of them did. And it started really making a difference because when people get it, it makes the difference. But when leadership isn't there, it's so hard to work in school. Um, the DOE is like ridiculous to work on with on policy. They just, every time we try to do anything with them, and I'll give an example a little later, a specific, my favorite quotes, um, they don't want to change. The last thing the Department of Ed wants is the state telling them what to do. And so we ran in time and time again. You know, we even said, we'll pay for all the positions, we'll do this, and they're like, well, you know, and they agree to it, and then we go to the ledge and they testify against it. Ah. So, very difficult. Um, and change, it takes a year, but a foundation is being built. And the, I think the measurement of that is tricky. We did a lot of surveying, we tried to figure out where people are, but you kind of build it and you see it and it happens, but it definitely took us, you know, 10, 15 years to see a lot of the changes in the schools that we were trying to do on kind of a short term. All right, now, one of my stupid ideas. So, we want to do community intervention, right? And this is, you know, this whole community development model, the whole let the community tell you what to do. And so like, that's brilliant, right? We're community-based, participatory, we're gonna be awesome. And we put out this grant program, and all these people came in. This is, you know, just on Hawaii and Kauai. We gave them $15,000 grants each to do health improvement programs. We were really psyched about that. We're like, they're gonna do it. That one in Lapa Hoihoi was a train museum, and they were gonna bring the kids in, they were gonna see the trains, and it was gonna be awesome. And then we funded all these, like, I mean, how many, how cool is that? All across the state, right? It was terrible. We got like nothing out of it. It didn't work, and it didn't work for several reasons. One, the infrastructure wasn't there. Two, policies made at the county level. There is no, you know, Pearl City government. You can't change policy at that level. And, the organizations would take the money and spend it on a little program, and when the program was over, they'd come and look more money for us. And I said, well, no, that was the, you know, that was kind of the infrastructure, we're supposed to keep doing this. Now, you know, what's your sustainability plan? We'll write a grant. I'm like, no, 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 that's not a sustainability plan. That just keeps asking for money. So it was a tremendously bad failure. I mean, we really got almost nothing out of this. And it was really disappointing, because I thought it was gonna be, I thought it was gonna be good, and we spent a lot of money on it. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so then, so this, you know, they did some stuff, and the, so they did, you know, renovated walking paths. This one they did illegally. Um, they just went down and cut a path to the beach through private land. I'm like, you can't do that, you know. Like, oh, we didn't ask permission. And, um, you know, so they did some stuff, but there was, I mean, really, on at the end of the day, a year later, we're like, there's nothing we can even say that happened. But, you know, we enjoyed it, and we learned a lesson. So hopefully I have taught you a lesson today of, Make sure you have a real good plan, and if you are going to use small grants out, like make sure you know what's going to that you have some way of making them lasting. Because giving agencies small amounts of money to do something that they tried to do, built environment stuff, but you just can't do it at any kind of scale. And that was, I mean, if you look at fifteen thousand for all of those, that's a lot of money, right? So then we did targeted interventions. Um, they did some traffic calming, calming around schools. We did a very nice, actually, joint um, land use agreement between the city, county, Department of Park and Rec, and Department of Ed, um, and an urban school. Um, developed a uh, Native Hawaiian food literacy program in our Hawaiian immersion schools. They were nice demonstration projects, but again, the dollars spent and the value returned was very limited. So that middle one, we had a, um, we had a, a school that was in the, in the downtown Honolulu area, and they were able to have Parks and Rec, there was no park in the area, so Park and Rec was able to come in, run their activities, that kind of thing. It was one school, it was one school, and when they had a change of administration, they stopped doing it, right? And so we, had the, we still have the joint use policy on there, but the programming stopped. And so, again, disappointing. You know, we spent, I, I don't know, I wanna say these were 50,000 a piece, and that was, those were the three good ones that I could list, so I'm not too embarrassed. But again, it wasn't, it was, you know, mediocre, not a huge effect. And you see, you go, how the heck do you do community intervention that's actually gonna be workable, sustainable, and population scalable? It's gonna change the difference. So we started funding coalitions. And so we funded each county coalition. I said, you know what, policies made at the county. 
I'm going to fund the darn county or you know people at the county level to make a change. Um, this was our Kauai, This is our Kauai County Coalition. Amazing. It was actually received the award from the National Physical Activity Plan as the best coalition in the nation uh, two years ago. They have exploded and done everything you can imagine in terms of policy, in terms of environment, in terms of catalyzing the community. The leader for this ran a program called the Kauai Great Way Out. It was a weight loss program where they'd have like everybody like from an office stand on this industrial scale and they'd say you're 2,500 pounds and then he'd weigh out at the end. And We got her in, we trained her up in policy and environment and she got it but it was her energy, enthusiasm and the ability to motivate others that made all the difference. And, and that's one of the biggest things that I've learned in coalition development is you don't need to know the content. You can train somebody on the content, but you can't train somebody on their personality, their ability to bring community together to get people excited about it. It also helped that she was the mayor's personal trainer. Um, so he bought in. And so we had this incredible, across all of our counties, we passed and implemented complete streets. The Kauai one is like the model program, and they really redid their entire street design. And that's from starting with the head of public work saying, I'm not interested in this at all. You know, I used to walk down the sidewalk barefoot, you know, and in the mud, why do we need a sidewalk? And, you know, to being a champion of this, it's speaking at national conferences. Uh, we got EBT, all our farmers markets for low income folks. They also passed, this is amazing, they passed a surcharge on moving violations um, that fund safe routes to school. So our Kauai coalition wrote a bill at the state level, got it funded, um, to put you know, an extra twenty dollars, I think it's twenty twenty-five dollars, on every time you get a moving violation, and that money goes back to the counties to fund their safe routes to school program. Sustainable because people keep speeding, right? <laughs> but just amazing. I mean, that, that they would come up and do that. Um, they did some stuff to really engage leadership, right? As I said, leadership is so important. They did a mayorathon, right? So what they would do is the mayor would lead a walk throughout the Kauai and the trails and everything. He loved it because it made him the most popular guy around. The guy wins like 80, 90% of the vote now. It's like crazy. Um, he also did a mayor's walking work bus. So he would walk to work from different parts of the island. And he would also bring out all of his um, directors of all the different um, agencies in the county. And anybody that wanted to walk with him could walk with him. So you want to walk with him and you want to talk to the park and rec guy, he's there. You want to talk to public works, he's there. You want to talk to the school person, they're there. And it really let the community get involved. And it also, you know, the mayor's walking along and you get the thing, you can't cross the street because the traffic's too bad, the sidewalk's broken, and his public works guy is next to him. You want to know how long it took till the, the crew was out there fixing that? About two hours. You know, it's amazing what happens when you get your, your elected officials out to actually look at walkability in your community on a regular basis and saying, hey, we can't do this. And look, there's kids trying to get to school and they can't get across the street. You know, it makes such a difference, to, you know, more than the data argument is going to make it, it's actually getting, you know, people on the ground to see it. All right, social marketing. So we did a whole bunch of social marketing. Phase one, we did general awareness raising. We, we ran a campaign called Start Living Healthy. This is you have to start somewhere. Um, it was terrible. It didn't work. Don't do that. Um, you know, being very general and generic in social media is throwing your money away. Um, and we found nothing. The second one we did is this campaign called One Percent or Less is Best. And it was to get people to switch from whole and two percent milk to uh, one percent milk. And so this, we, we did is we had these commercials with kids, that's one of our posters. Uh, there's the same amount of saturated fat in one glass of whole milk as five strips of bacon. And there's the same amount in two percent milk as three strips of bacon. So we saw, and I want to say the estimate is 20,000 people changed their, to low fat milk because of this campaign. And we actually had the sales data from our dairy so I could get hard numbers on the number of sales. Here's the interesting thing. We saw almost no change in people that were drinking whole milk. But we saw a ton of change in the people that were drinking 2%. You know why? 2% sounds healthy. Think about it. It's 2% milk. How bad can it be? Whole milk's 3.5%. No one knows that. You say whole milk, people think that's 100%. Right? So I went from 100 to 2, what more do you want me to do? And they don't think that 1 is half of that, 1 is 1% 1 less, right? If you can't do math, you get all confused. 
So we saw this huge, and it was people, it really, it was, it was people that thought 2% was healthy. And when they heard the commercial, and that's a very easy change to make, right? You say, okay, I can move from two to one, and I cut 50% of my fat out, it's not 1%. Um, and then we went on to specific messaging, I'll talk a little more about with um, three minutes daily physical activity, and five strings of fruit and vegetables a day, and then finally rethink your drink. So this was our Step It Up campaign, 10 week campaign on, um, uh, based on theory of uh, planned behavior, um, press conference starting it, three uh, TV spots, radio spots. Uh, I wrote a weekly article in the paper, walking teams posters. These were our actors. Um, the female actor is actually from the health department, so all our secondary actors in our commercials we got for free from the health department, which was nice. <laughs> and she actually lost, I think, 45 pounds because she started walking every day because she'd been in the commercials, which was awesome. I don't think he did, but he was a professional actor. They don't listen to anything. Um, and fruit and veggie, good choice, was a very similar one. But what's cool about this, and this is something that's very interesting, is trying to find the partnerships, the public-private partnerships. Um, we partnered with Foodland, which is the um, largest grocery store in the state. And they um, did all these mobile farmer's markets outside where they actually got local produce in, and they let us do radio remotes from those. We'd have radio stations that go down and do remotes. So we got a lot of free advertising out of that. Um, and they discounted the fruits and vegetables also, which was great. And um, cooking demos, again, the, the article, mall posters, school posters, and then we ran out, rolled out our physical activity plan uh, as part of that. This kid would not stop eating watermelon. I think he, his parents might have had to have an accident on the way home. He ate a lot of watermelon. It was not good. <laughs> so here's some of the articles that we wrote. So we had this fun, you know, and I'll talk about the, our more built environment stuff in a minute, but so these are articles that, that um, Bill Rigger Nash and I wrote, and then we get this big thing here that in the op-ed in the paper that they write, State health campaign must go beyond TV ads. Now, we did mostly built environment work. Did they ask us what we did in built environment? It pretty much says you should be doing more built environment work. You shouldn't just be doing any TV ads. I'm like, why didn't you ask us what we were doing? But thank you for pretty much setting it up so that we can say we're now spending our money on what the paper told us we had to do. Crazy. Um, we did Rethink Your Drink, which um, this was a campaign to uh, get, get folks from, from switching to, um, from soda to water uh, and sweet tea. And what we found was really interesting. So this was this one on the, um, I don't think, is there a pointer in this thing? I don't know. So this one over here, um, closer to me, it was our first one, which we really focused on soda. And you know, soda consumption in the US is dropping fairly dramatically now, which is really interesting. Um, but sugar-sweetened beverages isn't dropping. All right? So people are switching from sodas to um, coffee drinks to, um, I'm sorry, sweet teas. Yeah, sweet teas. Except for in Texas, and I yell at them. Um, and so what we did is we did that second one, and she's actually in a coffee shop, and we did them all around sweetened coffees. And so we said, okay, we saw our data. We got, we got a, a one serving a week drop in sodas in that first one. And then we said, let's focus much more on the coffee drinks and talk about how bad the coffee drinks and how many calories and stuff are in them. Um, because a lot of our, especially our teens, were drinking a, you know, a lot of the mocho, choco, latto thing. It was not good for them. Um, but again, both, all three of those campaigns were very, were very successful. Um, one thing here, this is just, because I like to put weird stories in. So this is Duke Iona. Um, Duke was our lieutenant governor. And so when we sent up the, the fruit and vegetable and the physical activity campaigns to the governor's office, um, they came back to us and we had to get them approved by the governor's office, the health department. And they said, well, lieutenant governor, we got good news and bad news. All right. Lieutenant governor, loves your TV spots. Awesome. The bad news is, Lieutenant Governor loves your TV spots and wants to be in them. <laughs> He's a terrible actor too, it's awful. <laughs> so we had to reshoot the TV spots and put them in them, right? So extra expense, put them in, you know, this is the idea of working with politics. And then a month later, this happened. Lieutenant Governor announces he's running for governor. So we're on the news and how it's illegal to run these spots because he's in them. So we had to pull them all. Anyone that he appeared in had to be pulled. And then, of course, he lost. And so then it was like, oh, that's the old administration's campaign. And so we had to do a lot of, you know, we had to, we had to stop all of them at that point. And we had to kind of lay low so people didn't figure out that we were with them. And it was, he worked for um, Linda Lingle, who was our only Republican governor since statehood. And so, of course, we're back to Democrats, thank God. 
And um, I didn't say it out loud, not in Texas. Um, <laughs> I'm not nonpartisan, I should mention that. Um, but it is the, it's the issue of, you know, of getting politicians, and one of the difficulties of working in a state agency is that you do face this a lot. And you know, if the lieutenant governor says he wants to be in the spots, the lieutenant governor is gonna be in the spots. Like there's not much you can say to stop him from doing it, but you know, cause a lot of, a lot of havoc. Um, so specific, you know, more specific, better, they work better with uh, community campaigns. How are we doing on time here? You having fun? You guys still awake? A little more time? All right. Okay, this one I'll just do quickly. I don't know how to, to educate doctors. Um, we fail miserably twice in trying to educate doctors. Like we did one that was a general one. We gave a contract out. This group brought all these doctors out to fancy dinners and like ate steaks and stuff. And then they didn't do anything. And I'm like, well, that's not gonna work. And so then we did it through our pediatric residency program. And you know, it just, you, you can't just do physician education without changing the healthcare system. You know, I think if, if you know, Kaiser, which is integrated and has done exercises medicine, if it's part of an integrated system, it works. If you're just trying to change physicians, they're too busy, they can't do it without the supports. And, and we tried, and we tried twice on this thing, and, and literally, they were just, oh, it's awful. So, let's see, don't ever do that. Yeah, there, there she is, look how sad she is. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, if you can figure it out in an integrated system, I think it'll work. But, you know, honestly, and, and uh, you know, I think it's important, I think it's important thing is that we need to talk about our failures as well as our successes, because sometimes you do things and you think they're going to work. I mean, I really thought that, you know, because the first one didn't work, and I'm like, what if we go with the pediatricians? They're awesome, and they're with kids, and no. no. <laughs> Wrong, Jay. All right, so what do we do in policy and environments? Um, so... Policy and environment is challenging with state employees, right? So, you know, we're running out of the State Department of um, Health, and, you know, they're told what they can and can't say. And so we made really incredible progress on a soda tax, right? And we had the legislators kind of in hand and ready to go, and we had an election, and we got a new governor who, you know, because I'm from Texas A&M, we have George Bush there, so we have to put read my lips, no new taxes. And that's pretty much what he said. No new taxes. Nobody here is to, to talk about, you know, to talk about soda tax. And so they would go to the ledge and they'd go in front of the health committee and, and Josh Green, um, who's chair of the health committee, would ask, you know, he'd have the state health, you know, head of Healthy Hawaii up in front of him and he'd say, so, you know, so this bill is going to decrease soda consumption. Yes. It's going to decrease childhood obesity. Yes. It's going to increase the revenue of the state, yes. And you're against it, yes. And it was just, I mean, that's, that's the level of working with people that work for the state. They have to follow the governor's line. So it ended up being really difficult. Um, and so what we were able to do, <laughs> in our sneaky way, is um, get the governor to um, create a task force on childhood obesity. And we were able to put both government and non-governmental people on that. So the non-governmental people were able to take the message and speak on behalf of the task force when the state took a background role to it, which is such an important thing, and that's why partner, all these things, partnership is essential um, to success. So here are my favorite quotes from our OBC task force. Because, you know, I always have a good time. So I had one of the assistant superintendents from the DOE come up to me, he goes, Jay, listen, we're here to educate Hawaii children not to make them healthy. That's your job. I'm like, what? So the DOE doesn't think healthy kids is important at all. No. All right, so they've come around, but it's, we, they kept shooting down our bills, so they're on the task force, and we, we do a thing, you know, kids have to get a physical exam when they enter school in Hawaii, right? So if you come in at kindergarten, you do it then. If you come in later, you do it then. But never again is there a physical exam. So we said, you know, it'd be great if we got them a physical exam before they went into middle school so we could track things like obesity, like vaccinations, like those things, and get letters back to the parents to say, you know, your kid's BMI is, you know, in a rate we need to be concerned about, or you haven't gotten your vaccines, that kind of thing. Um, they wouldn't go along with it. They actually voted, they would, you know, go against us in the legislature. That's too much work or, you know, the t favorite trick of the DOE is that's going to take $50 million for us to track those records and you're like, it's not going to happen. So, um, so that was always fun. And then my, my buddy from um, the Hawaii DOT and this guy was in and he was, you know, I thought he was on our side, you know, we were talking and uh, he says, yeah, you know, what we need to do is get rid of all these fast food restaurants that have drive throughs because the traffic from the drive-through blocks goes into the travel lane. 
And so I'm like, okay, well, it's kind of a weird way to do it, but I'm happy with less fast food drive throughs and, and I'm thinking we're doing well. And then he says, you know, he goes, hey, what do you think of this? He goes, you know, we tax the cars. You know, they pay gasoline tax, they pay, but we don't tax the cyclists. And shouldn't they be taxed to use the roads? And I'm like, oh my God, we're on day step one again. I'm like, okay, let's go over this again. This is why we want more people on bikes and walking. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff takes years and years of education, you know, and then it's just, you think you've got people and then they say something and you're like, I don't have them yet. We're going to work on the public health, but, um, you know, and it is people are coming from different, you know, the, a lot of engineers are not coming from, they're coming from how do I move people fastest from point A to point B, not, um, you know, the health of, of the populations. So we got to this, we got to this really beautiful set of policy recommendations from our task force, and I believe we're at the point about half of them now have been implemented. So we're actually, you know, these are all state level um, things, so it, it's been really, really good. Um, and we went forward, and we have this group called Good Juju, who will draw cartoons of your stuff, which I think is kind of cool. Um, all right, so I know I'm running out of time. Let's do this one. So did it work? So um, when I came to Hawaii, we were the ninth healthiest state in the country for the last five years in a row. Hawaii has been the healthiest state in the country, and the gap is increasing. Every year, uh, Massachusetts is number two, and it's getting bigger and bigger. So Hawaii is like taking off from the rest of the nation in the healthiest state in the nation. Um, the obesity rates have plateaued and have started coming back down. We hit about 24, we're at 22.7 now. So we're actually seeing declining uh, obesity rates. And I showed the smoking stuff before and, and we're doing really, really well. So all in all, it looks like, you know, when you're number one five times in a row, it's hard to fight that gets, you know, that, uh, that your data is not there. So it looks like, you know, the state's doing really well. And I think, you know, I think a lot of it is attributable to the work that we did, but it took 15 years. So all that stuff we promised, it wasn't I had to leave the state. We actually, you know, we came uh, across and actually got where we wanted to. All right. Now, then I moved to Texas, <laughs> where you can buy a steak in the shape of Texas. And for Valentine's Day, they do a heart-shaped one. Um, you can get a steak in the shape probably of anything. It's wonderful. So I moved there, and, you know, these men's fitness things aren't always, or men's health aren't the most accurate, but, you know, this cracked me up. You know, what are the fattest cities in the U.S.? I'm like, I hope none of these are in Texas. But, yeah, uh, let's see, Corpus, El Paso, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, like, that's probably not the best thing in the world. Um, maybe we have an issue in Texas. Um, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that. Some of these are fun, but you'll get them another time. <laughs> oh, where is there? Where is my, okay. So, what we've been doing in Texas, so, we work with the legislature um, right when I got there, and they actually gave us $10 million. We said, you know, look, you're spending a ton of money. Now, this is a fun slide. I didn't make this 27 counties in, in South Texas, but $10 million to do Healthy South Texas. Those counties are all blue, and they're all blue counties, because it's all our Democrats are in the bottom of the state. Um, <laughs> but we had a legislative champion who got that money for us, got it earmarked um, to bring, and this is, I think this idea is, genius, and it's not mine, um, but I love it and I promote it. Um, AgriLife Extension, so every um, state in the nation has a land-grant university, uh, you guys are Davis, um, who has extension agents, right? So AgriLife, which happens to be at Texas A&M, which we love, has county agents in every single county in Texas, 254 counties, there's actually 250 offices um, of embedded folks in the community that are in family and consumer sciences and don't know what to do. They're old home ec, right? And we don't really do home ec as much anymore, but so they're saying, what do we do now? How can we change this? So what this money has done is let us bring public health and extension together to create health extension agents. That creates a public health workforce for me and they wanna hire people with MPHs, which puts jobs for all our public health schools. So I'm excited about this. We just, we're, we're a bit over a year into this now. We're doing a lot of stuff in South Texas. We're actually moving towards, um, moving to healthy Texas and trying to get coalitions in every county focused on policy, environmental change, and some of the programmatic stuff around diabetes. But um, this could be a big idea that shifts the country, right? Especially in rural ag states where we have tons of of folks, and even in California, I know it seems you know, fairly urban here, but you know, the whole inner part of California is, is ag, right? And so there's ag extension, and they tend to be, um, you know, rural folks tend to have poor health outcomes in urban folks. And so there's a lot of ways we can change, and a lot of ways we can make a difference there. Um, 
But of course, you know, just working in Texas made me bored um, because you know, I like to help Frank say I like to look at Hawaii at number one, it makes me happy. Um, the rankings route once again, and the South dominates in obesity. So the southern United States, you might have guessed, is not the healthiest place in the world. Um, this is one of those things from USA Today, and you never know how much, you know, their, their data is not the most accurate all the time, but it's decent. Look at this now. This is the top 10 fattest cities in the U.S. Do you know, what do you notice about, first of all, what do you notice about how they drew the U.S.? <laughs> it's only the South. They didn't even bother to show the rest of the country because all 10 of them are in the South. And my poor little McAllen campus, you know, I have a campus in McAllen, which is number four. Um, I'm like, oh, geez, you know, we're there. And it's, but it's across the South, and it really says, you know, if we look at the epicenter of the problem of obesity in this country, it is in the southern United States. And actually, if we look at the health rankings across the southern United States, Mississippi's 50, 49 Louisiana, 48 Arkansas, 47 Alabama, thank God for West Virginia, 45 Kentucky, 44 Tennessee, 42 South Carolina, 41 Georgia, 37 Missouri, 36 Florida, and we're, we're the healthy guys. We're at 33, we're still in the bottom half, you know? And so, you know, across the South, we do terrible, right? And so, you know, but what do we love in the South? We love football, right? Love football, and Texas A&M is in the SEC, right? Southeastern Conference, you know, Pac-12, come on, that's just silly, right? This is real football. Um, <laughs> See, I can do that because you guys aren't in the, you know, it's the. <laughs> so, so yesterday I brought representatives from all of the schools of the SEC together in a planning meeting to say, what are our big ideas to move the health of the, the southern states out of the bottom? And how can the SEC coalesce to really create something that changes the health status of all these states and move them out of the bottom? We had just a fantastic meeting. I had about 25 people there. Um, you know, we're getting places like Clinton Foundation and Robert Wood Johnson, CDC, um, really interested in what we're doing. I think we're going to, you know, we've got some, I can't tell you what they are just yet, but then the ag piece obviously is big in it. But we've got really great ideas, and, and I think it's something in the next couple of years that we're going to put together an effort across the southern region um, with these institutions that make up over 600,000 students, faculty, and staff, and the states make up one third of the population in the United States. And tremendously health disparate, shorter lifespans, and something that we can make a difference uh, as a collective. So that's my latest thing that's getting me into trouble, but um, thank you so much for all your time, appreciate it. All right, questions anybody? Are we done? We have three minutes. <laughs> anybody got a question? Yeah. You gotta bit the big mic on a stick. Yeah. <laughs> See, we, it would be bacon on a stick if you were in Texas. Whose idea was this? <laughs> um, so, uh, and I really liked your uh, your intervention messages. So, can you just tell us, especially since we have students here, um, the process of the formative work that you did and how you went about sort of tailoring these messages and, and on the social marketing stuff? Yeah. Sure. So we actually did. Um, we did a fairly comprehensive process on all of these that would involve um, focus groups. So we, we would start with the focus groups. We'd actually go into um, looking at, there's a process where you can look at people that are doing the behavior versus those that aren't. And you can, you can see what variables are, um, see, you're gonna get me all technical. I have a paper on this. Um, <laughs> that you can look at, you know, kind of what you can do, discriminant function analysis, right? And you can see the difference between the two groups and say, okay, you know, everybody says that, you know, when I exercise, I get sweaty, right? Because everybody gets sweaty when they exercise. But you know, people that don't exercise have, you know, their, their time issue is a big issue. Um, they have issues about just motivation. So it takes the big list and it says, these are the things that differentiate. And then we take that, then we put it with a creative company that then gives us storyboards and gives us a couple of different ideas. And then we pitch them in the focus groups to see which one resonates with the population um, you know, that's at risk. And the more that you can be specific in who you're trying to reach. So when we did, um, you know, Rethink Your Drink was uh, teens and preteens. So it was about, I think it was 12 to 16 that we really focused on for that one. Um, 
when we did the um, walking campaign, it was 35 to 55 year old adults, knowing that job, family, those kind of things were big at that age frame. And so being more specific gives you a lot more ability to change populations. And one of the biggest mistakes people make in, in social marketing is trying to do everybody with one campaign because you can't and it won't resonate. Um, and certainly, and I, I do a whole slide on that when we look at the number of beers there are out there and why are there so many, why does Budweiser produce like 15 different types of beer when it's all terrible? Um, <laughs> but they market differently to everybody, right? So, okay. yeah. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you guys. School of Public Health. We'd like to thank you, Dr. Maddox, for coming over and giving us this raring go. good speech. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. This concludes our speaker series. We hope that you do. Uh, it, we we hope that you enjoyed it and that you come back again next year for more public health speakers. Thank you.